Welcome to Silicon Valley Buzz, the show where we discuss happenings in this, the most fertile spot on the planet for new ideas. I'm Seth Shostak. Our producer is Janet Wu. So, how's the job market working for you? Well, the venture capitalists think there are opportunities here. They continue to pump more money into Northern California, into this area, than any other spot in the country. In fact, 40% of <coughs> all the venture capital being invested in the United States is coming to our area. So have you got the job you want? Will your kids have the job they want? And if not, why not? My guests tonight are Sue Connolly, founder of KitList, a well-known site used by recruiters, employers, and job seekers. Sue, welcome to the show. Thanks, Seth. And Tom Means. Tom Means is on the Mountain View City Council. He's also in the Economics Department at San Jose State University. Tom, welcome to the show as well. Welcome. Okay, nationally, the unemployment rate's a tad over 9%. How does that stack up with what it is around here, Tom? Well, you know, locally in the San Jose area, it's a little higher than that. But, you know, the positive signs are the increases in employment in the high-tech sector. Where you're seeing big problems are still in the housing area. So our unemployment rate is even higher than the national average, despite... Just slightly. Okay, maybe not significantly. Is that yeah. holding steady? Is it going up, going down? Uh, the numbers I looked at recently, it hasn't changed much. It's just pretty much going with the national trend of up and down. Okay. But there are hidden numbers, though, and, and I, I think that's the reality that people know kind of on the street, but it's not really being reported upon. There are people who are underemployed, people who are in the wrong jobs, and then people who are just really dropping off the books because they've been unemployed for so long. And so I think the reality there is what's not really being addressed really by the media <coughs> quite as much, and that's where... I think locally with more opportunity happening, I think it's helping to get people connected up to where the things are actually happening is going to be the way we get people back to work faster. So, so these numbers are really underestimates. Way underestimated, well, yes. When you say yeah. way, I mean a factor of two, what? Well, you know, I would imagine, and, and this is just kind of hypothetical, I don't have any real numbers to substantiate it, but I would say it's another two points above what that's, they're reporting because there are people I know that have been unemployed for over two years, and those are not counted. I know plenty of people who are working in jobs that are part-timers, that it's not even full-time work. It, they're being paid a fraction, not even a quarter of what they're used to being paid. There are people that I know that are ready to lose their homes even though they're kind of semi-employed. So the reality is actually grimmer in some respects, but then the upside is actually more optimistic too. It sounds like there's a great deal of underemployment as much as well, unemployment. Yeah, I mean, again, unemployment just measures those looking for work that haven't found work. and so. As Sue said, some people drop out. This was a pretty deep recession. And so you have people that stop, and then as things start to improve, they come into the labor market and actively seeking work, but then they count as unemployed since they're not working at this point. And then you have those that are underemployed by, you know, I took a job doing something else. You know, I was an engineer, but now I'm doing something at a lower pay and so forth. So there is a lot of that. The BEA does report kind of a measure of that sometimes of this how many people are really unemployed uh, that, you know, in, in, including some of the stuff she just mentioned, and it is a lot higher. Uh, tell but, me. but they haven't done that for a long time, so it's hard to compare with other presidents and saying, or other administrations say, you're the worst. This one's high. Yeah. Well, well, let me ask you this. I mean, this is the Silicon Valley. When I read the local papers, they're all drumming up enthusiasm for our economy. When I get on Highway 101, I see more traffic than I did two years ago. That, to me, is a good barometer of the, the state <laughs> right, of economic stuck activity. Going somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, why is it that we're stuck with, uh, you know, the national average unemployment? What what industries are hiring? If are are not hiring, because it sounds like whatever the high tech industries are doing is not enough for the valley. Well, I mean, look, you know, you mentioned I'm on the Mountain View City Council. Google is expanding. They are still hiring. Facebook is going to be hiring, and some of the other high tech areas are hiring lots of people. But again, that's for kind of you know, white collar, college, graduate school type degrees. Uh, but if you look at how much housing we're building in our city, it's not enough. And, and, we, and, and a lot of permits and things we approved two years ago, projects are done. They're not happening. So what, what, what fraction of the valley is involved in the high tech business, roughly? You know, I, I don't know the exact difference on that, proportion on that. But again, you know, there, there are all kinds of different labor markets out there. But, you know, we're, you know let's take, for example, manufacturing done. You know, I mean, and people that, you know, a few weeks ago, Gavin Newsom said, we want to bring manufacturing back to California. I don't think that's realistic. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm not going to bring those back. Now, Sue, you run a uh, website, am I, am I well, correctly? It, it's called it Kit List, so tell me about <laughs> Kit List. Well, it's, uh, so it's my Keep in Touch list, and it's kitlist.org. And it really, it's very simply a job email list. So people sign up for it free of charge, and they get job emails coming to them, and they reply to jobs for which they're uh, most you know, qualified. And employers and, recruiters use, it, employers and recruiters use it to be able to reach different people that they'd get, <laughs> excuse me, in, uh, in other markets. And the kit list is primarily in the Silicon Valley, so it's kind of like the inside scoop on where to get some professionals. I I'm looking for a job. I, I go to kit list. Kit stands for keep in touch. Keep in touch. Yeah. Keep in touch. Now, so, so what do I do? Do I, do I send an email to, to kit list and say, or, or put it on the site, post it somehow, and say, look, I'm looking for a job in the tech sector, and I, I can do this, that, and the other, and I have uh, experience programming, C++, whatever it yep. is. Is that what happens? No, no it's, it's so bare bones. I mean, we really, we use Yahoo groups to deliver the emails free. So what happens is employers and recruiters post the jobs, and it goes direct, directly to people's inboxes. And then the job title is in the subject line, and if it's something that's of interest of you, for you, or if you think it might be good for a friend of yours, you'd forward it on. It's as simple as that, and you just reply to the jobs that fit you. There was an AP story recently in which they uh, talked about the hot job prospects nationwide, mm -hmm. not, not restricted to California, certainly not the Silicon Valley. And the, the, the top five were accountant, IT professional, massage professional, there's the rub, okay. caregivers <laughs> for seniors, and social media str strategist. Right. I got it right there. Uh, how does that square with what you're seeing on Kit List? I, I definitely see that with um, social media becoming something that is um, getting more mature. I, I'm, I actually do marketing myself, and social media is really becoming a more legitimate tool for you know, B2B and B2C. So there aren't a lot of people who are expert in it, and I think that in this valley <coughs> are a lot of marketing people who are very, very talented, and they're learning now to try to pick up these new skills because this is the, the area of expertise you need to pick up. Tom, you're in direct contact with the young people down at San Jose State. Right. Uh, a lot of them taking economics. Can they get jobs? What, what, what field should they be studying at San Jose State to have the best chance of a satisfying well, and gratifying and lucrative <laughs> job? Well, I'm always going to recommend economics because I think it's a good tool building major in terms of thinking and solving problems. But, you know, obviously you look at where the market's going. You've got the tech sector, so computer skills and, and IT type skills are important. Business skills are important, and then you know you see, um, I forgot the other one you mentioned there, uh, social networking and things yes. like that. All those things are important because that's, you know, it's hard to predict where the market's going to go, but that seems to be where things are going right now. And so, um, you know, I tell students, you know, to get good training and good skills. That once you go out into business, you know, you will learn on the job. But but right. come prepared, know how to make good decisions. But, but what about? I mean, my advice would always have been, you know, at least learn how to read and write. I mean, study English, yeah. be good at writing because no matter what area you right. go into that, I mean, is that still true or is that not true? If you don't, you know, if you yeah. don't know, you don't have IT skills, uh, I mean. That, that, that can be an issue. I mean, I have, you know, in our programs we have lots of, uh, you know, uh, foreign students coming in and they want to work here and their husbands or spouses are working here and, you know, we have to worry about sometimes the, 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 those types of communication skills and sometimes that's an issue. Uh, you know, I teach a lot of statistics and high-level econometrics, and, you know, I make my students write reports because I said at some point, if you want to move up and be a manager, you're going to have to communicate with the people under you, and, know, and you know, you want to make sure you do it competently. Well, we actually have a couple of uh, Rolands, as they're called, videos here from young people okay. who have been looking for jobs here in the Silicon Valley, and, in fact, uh, have taken jobs as interns. So I, I, let's take a look at them because I think that they bring up some interesting points about young people looking for jobs. Okay. Hi, my name is Jesse Connors and I'm a recent college graduate from UCSB getting a degree in film and media studies. Uh, I've been looking for a job for about a year now, sending in resumes and occasionally getting an interview, but largely the only thing that's been available to me has been unpaid internships. Um, it really feels like there's so many people vying for these jobs that there's so many people without skills that employers just want to hire people at no pay because they can. And as a result, I uh, really feel that the job options are limited.
My name is Jan Hyman, and I'm a recent graduate of San Francisco State University. I graduated about a year ago with um, a degree in film uh, with a concentration in animation. Um, and I've applied to the, lar the major um, animation studios, you know, like Pixar and DreamWorks and Disney, Nickelodeon. Um, you know, not much success there, which I, you kind of expect when you're an artist, you're not always going to get the big jobs. But it's, for, it's just been a string of um, unpaid internships and freelance work, and it's not, you don't always get paid. You know, sometimes they promise pay or they promise work for the future. Um, but you don't always get it, and generally when the project is over, then they dump you and just find another unpaid intern. Um, and out of my entire graduating class of animation students, none of us have landed any big studio jobs. Most of us are working part-time, and um, we get freelance work every now and then, paid or not, we take what we can get. So I don't know what's in store for the future, but um, I hope it doesn't continue this way forever. Well, several interesting things there. To begin with, these were young people who were interested in jobs in the media. Mm -hmm. And of course, the media is a bit of a glamour industry, and uh, consequently, there's a lot of competition, of course, for jobs there. Uh, do, do you see any action in that field, in the media field? Well, I wouldn't talk to media particularly, but I think that kind of the challenge for students is you come out, you've got a lot of uh, knowledge, but not a lot of expertise yet. And you really don't have a network yet. And I think that really the key for anyone, regardless of age, is not just sending out a thousand resumes, because that's an easy thing to do right now, but to really find where the personal linkage is. So it's trying to see whom you, you have in your, and I don't call it the network, it's more your friend work. You know, networking has always been kind of an anathema to me. It sounds very calculated, and people are always in a what's in it for me kind of an attitude, or, you know, kind of like the, alms for the poor thing. I'm looking for a job. Can you help me? Right. And I think if you look at your friend work and say, look, I'm here to help my friends. Um, friends who are here to help me. And I would tell these students to look at their parents' friends and see who might have contacts in companies which they want. And rather than do um, you know, a rifle, a, a shotgun effect, choose a few key companies that they want to get into and find out who they know there, meet with them, and try to get in a little deeper. The internship thing is an opportunity, but it, it is it can be a well, well, I, yeah. I want to uh, ask yeah. Tom about that, but yeah. uh, so, so there's something in this. I mean, you said use their f uh, friend, friend, work. friend work, friend work, mm -hmm. new word for me, the friend work to get a job with a network, <laughs> kind mm -hmm. of uh, ironic in a way. But the media, okay, the media is a specialized industry. I mean, you know, that's always been hard to get into. It's always been said, it's not what you know, it's whom you know. And you're saying the same thing, actually, you know, find somebody who's already connected to the business. Right. The other point that they made, indeed, and Tom, I, maybe I should ask you the, about this, because this is almost an economics question. They said, you know, these internships, they might be fun, but it's slave labor, if you will, for yeah. the, the companies. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, they, they can run on it endlessly. Is that a significant factor? Well, you know, it, it's tough when you come in with no experience in the job market. And I think, regardless there, anyone with any other degree coming out of college is competing with people that may have been laid off in the last few years and so employers can say you know what we're looking for people with five years experience well if you're a new graduate you're not gonna have that so how do you get into this market Catch when it's 22. been so bad and 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 they can look at this and say you know we, we've got people with five years experience that are unemployed we're gonna hire them first and so forth because it's just you know they know they're get what they're getting in that case so it is tough when you like that internships can be a source when the economy's booming, you know, a lot of companies pay internships. Um, you know, give, give you an example, some of my friends that came out of law school in the last few years, uh, basically the law firm said, we're not going to pay you, go do an internship where for a, you know, some, you know, low-income nonprofit, and we'll pay you half your salary and come back when we have r room for you, basically. So it's tough to get started when you're a new graduate, and that's, I think what you heard there is pretty typical of what a lot of kids would say, and then I agree with Sue is, You've got to try to establish some type of network of people so that you can kind of get your foot in the door and at least talk and find out what is it you guys do and, and where could I fit in. You, you made an interesting point there about the fact that the companies might want somebody with experience. Yeah. And these days, because so many people are looking for jobs, they can get somebody who's had five years in right. that slot. Right. They fit in the, the hole that they've got. They, they're the right peg for that hole. Whereas in the past, they would have to hire somebody out of college and train them. 
Okay, so that sounds to me like the jobs may be sliding down the scale. In other words, jobs that were formerly taken by 22-year-old college grads are now being taken by 28-year-old kids that are people who <laughs> have well, had some and, experience. And it because mm -hmm. they had jobs and then they got laid off. Right. And this was a very serious recession. So there are a lot of people with skill levels out there that are going to have to come back in the marketplace. Are, are, are people, are college grads taking jobs that should have been intended for high school grads? Well, I, I don't think that's actually a bad thing. To be really honest, I think that throughout our entire history, we've had peaks and valleys in the economy. And you hear the you know, rags to riches stories of people who get into a company and they start off in the mailroom and they work their way up. I really think that getting in somewhere and establishing a reputation as someone who's willing to work hard, really give it their best and be ethical, I think that does have its own reward. People do move as a result of that. You know, conversely, yeah. Older people, are, or even people who are very senior, aren't getting jobs for which they're overqualified because companies are afraid to hire them, even though they're getting more than their money's worth. So I think everyone's facing a real challenge right now, and it's just looking and saying, how can you be creative about getting in to a company or making some contacts where people will know who you are as a person and then be willing to vouch for you? So it's, yeah. it, 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 Well, sorry, that's the other extreme where you have now the seniors, say 50 to 60, I'm saying senior job experience, right. they get laid off and then that's e that's another tough area to because now when you come back, you know they think well this guy's going to want too much money so I can't hire him and would he be willing to take a cut and pay because this is the level so there's kind of that those two extremes there that I think are real difficult sometimes. It, it, this is like the wayback machine. It sounds like we're going back to the 1920s or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. I mean everybody well, I mean, starts it, at the bottom. Yeah, I mean that's that's the problem sometimes when you have these severe recessions is. How do you kind of restart the labor market? I have or to ask you the that. obvious question. Are, are we getting out of that recession? You're an economist. Are we getting um, out of that? Again, you know, when people talk about this, they'll say, well, when we've had a very deep recession, we have very quick growth. And that's true for the previous recessions. It's not happening now. I think the things that are difficult this time are the uncertainties. You know, uncertainty in the, the labor costs. You've got, you know, health care plans that are going to be more expensive. You've got... Uh, all kinds of uncertainty about the regulatory environment, um, the environmental regulations, and so, uh, you know, at some point that's got to get settled so that people can say, okay, I, I can plan for the future and figure out who to hire. Sue? Well, I think what's really important here, too, is to look and say that it's reinventing ourselves. Um, I think that when you look at people who actually are doing careers in what they studied initially in school, in, in undergrad or graduate school, Many times the path is kind of multi-path, <laughs> multi and you have to look and say that in some cases there are other alternative things, like if, if right now filmmaking is really a tighter market, you look at other things that are similar to it that you can still keep building the skills. Uh, it could be in corporate events and doing videos and things like that. You, you look and say, where is the best opportunity for my skill sets as close as to my you know avocation and my passion as possible and keep working it and then you gradually get back on track or you might find that that other track is something you love entirely and and really when you look at anyone's career path I, I tended to be in the same career my entire short career since I graduated from high school a year ago but um, <laughs> <laughs> but many people they say you're going to have six different careers so I think what we all need to look at is to have fun with the idea of reinvention. Mm -hmm. um, to also look to have that constant thirst for knowledge because I'm finding that, I'm hearing from employers that some people are highly skilled, highly technical, have advanced degrees, don't have it in the technical areas that are now in demand. So go back to school, keep learning, keep searching, and then try some things new. Well, what know? about working for yourself? I mean, anybody I, do that? I'm a big advocate of that. Yeah, so. that, I mean, that can be a thing now too because you may have to be more flexible and entrepreneurial in the labor market. Because, you know, obviously, you know, I work at a university that's pretty structured, and some jobs are like that where you can stay there a long time. But, you know, out here, technology changes. I mean, you think of here, we've had computers, hardware, software, biotech. There's a lot of different technological innovations, which mean people have to be flexible. Yeah, I, I think Mark Zuckerberg is a great uh, yeah. uh, role model for that. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, the competitiveness, not just the Silicon Valley versus the rest of the country, but the country versus the rest of the world. We'll be right back. This is the Silicon Valley Buzz. Unlike commercial or public TV stations, we at KMVT Community Television focus on Silicon Valley residents, organizations, and businesses. 
we televised to over 100,000 viewers in Santa Clara County, with syndication potential to more than one million in the greater San Francisco Bay Area. KMVT connect Silicon Valley communities, empower people, and affect change. Do you? talking with Tom Means and Sue Connolly about the job situation here in the Silicon Valley. Well, I gotta tell you, I used to work uh, here in Mountain View, I uh, had an office, I should say, in which I had a window onto the parking lot so I could see who was coming in and out. I wasn't worried so much about our employers, but the employees of the firm upstairs, which was a high-tech Silicon Valley company. And 90, at least 90% of those employees were Indian. And I go out in the parking lot, and they had bumper stickers from the Indian Institute of Technology, very many of them, which is a very good uh, technical school. Are our schools keeping up? I mean, are we required to import technical talent even here in the Silicon Valley? Well, I think at some levels, you know, I'll give this kind of general answer. K through 12, I don't think we're going to doing a good job. But in college and so forth, we still attract the best students in the world. People want to come here to go to universities, whether it's Stanford, UCLA. I'll mention Berkeley, but I went to UCLA, and <laughs> and stuff. And so you know what? We still attract the best students. They want to come here at the university level. Do right? they stay here anymore? You know, when I was in school, most of my students from from Asian and Indian countries, they stayed here because even though they had good educations, their their economies didn't have a lot of economic freedom, so they wouldn't go back. You know, and it was great because they'd stay here and invent. And you see that here. Now you see in India they're starting to open up and have a little more economic freedom to open a business and do things like that. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I think at some point they're going to say, "I'll go back and, you know, and 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 make a success." And you see that in the Asian economies. But you know, I would say when I was in school in the '70s and '80s, it wasn't like that. They stayed over here because they said, "I can start a business and make money here." Well, I mean, is there any danger we'll become like a, I don't know the UK? No offense to the UK, no. but you know they have a great education a system. And everybody goes over there, goes to school, right. and then comes back. Right. And so I mean, you know, I mean, I guess that's a growth industry, education here. But uh, what's your uh, impression of the competitiveness of Bay Area schools in fulfilling the needs of the of the market of the job market? Well, I think it's important for us to recognize that the problem starts way back. When you talk about K through 12, um, I think we are falling behind very clearly. I think that in some respects the work ethic is not as strong as it is from, southern, from some other cultures. And I think employers recognize that. Uh, people, also it's an economic thing because they're able to get great talent for lower salaries. And I do see a definite trend in companies with which I've consulted with, I see, and I, um, and again, some of them are more concentrated in some of the semiconductor area or some of the you know, manufacturing, but um, there, what I am concerned about is seeing people who have gone through the educational system here in the states, where are they landing those jobs, especially in high tech? Yeah, what, what about the fact that America doesn't have, really never had, uh, the equivalent of a technical high school, right? It, I, I don't want to call it a trade school because it was really, you know, that, that sounds somewhat low-level demeaning and they, they really weren't. They were mm -hmm. very high-level schools, but you would learn a trade. You would, you know, right. learn to, to have the kind of jobs that pay very well in the United States now because there's nobody to fill them, you know, a plumber, an electrician, whatever, trade schools. Should we have the equivalent of technical high schools? Do we have the equivalent? I think we should have a school for innovation because I think our biggest asset as a nation is our ability to innovate and also entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that's going to get us out of this doldrums because it's not corporate America is having to consolidate and we're going to see more mergers and acquisitions over the years. The real hope is really coming from the small businesses, the medium-sized businesses as they're growing. And when we talk about this whole idea about reinventing, it has to be that you have to have fresh ideas and an ability to keep looking and saying, what's new? What's different? Where is there a need that's not being met yet? I am a little concerned with kind of the over-programmed kids that we have right now when they don't have a lot of free time to try to ponder some of the things about the universe. Why is it raining? Why are we doing this? When you get a little bit bored, you start getting creative. I worry that we don't have enough creative, innovative time to help develop those skills. Yeah, so 
I think you know universities here w are what generate a lot of those ideas and so forth. Whether you know, it, you know, we like what we have here, whether it's in the North Carolina, or the Massachusetts area, and things like that. You know, Thomas Friedman wrote that book. It's a flat world. That's not really true when it comes to ideas and innovation. It's not. We have competitive advantages here, and so as long as we continue to exploit those, I think you know this is going to be an area that grows, and we just have to be creative and so forth. And and that's why, you know, if you look at Housing prices, location, things like that. We're we've been pretty immune to a lot of stuff because we've innovated. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sir. I also think that I think closer collaboration with the government really helps. Ire Ireland is kind of a case in point, although it's hurting right now. They invested 30 years ago in their educational system. They changed their tax structures. They really made it conducive to have companies come in and build and grow. And then about 20 years later, they ended up being one of the strongest economies in the EU. I think that we need to have a closer collaboration with the government to be able to say we need to tighten some of these regulations so that we can, if you, if you take a company and you go beyond five people, in California State it's prohibitive to even start anything. I know a lot of people who are keeping things lean and mean. They can hire more people but they just become a different entity beyond a certain number and I think if we can loosen that a bit for the sake of getting people back to work, it would be a win-win. <coughs> you certainly hear a lot about that. Well, we're getting close to the end of the show. I just wanted to come back to a point that I, I made at the beginning, and that was that uh, the venture capitalists are giving thumbs up to the right. Silicon Valley. So, you know, what's, what, uh, just a couple of sentences, what's your take on what things are going to be like five years from now? So? I, I feel very optimistic about it. I'd also like to see them open their purse strings a little bit faster. And I also think that the, this time around, they're going to help companies grow more intelligently. I think before that money was kind of invested without a lot of guidance. So I'm actually seeing that with some startups I'm working with, and they're working more hand in hand with the innovators to make sure there's some practical business. You're that smiling. Are you, are you smiling, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm positive. I mean, I think you see a lot of positive signs here. I mean, you know, I have relatives and family and friends that lives in other parts in California, and it's not doing as well. Um, my concern is this area gets too expensive, then the other areas can compete with that. But, you know, I think as long as we're open and, and, and we continue to grow like that, I think we're going to be okay. Well, um, we're okay, except we're not okay for time. I have to say goodbye to my guest, Sue Connolly, Tom Means. Thank nice. you very much for Thanks being so. with us. And thank you for being with us here on Silicon Valley Buzz. We'll look forward to seeing you next month.